Welcome to the Energy in Property Key Features and Issues in Renewable or Low Carbon Energy Property webinar. Please note the session is being recorded. All delegates are in a listen only mode. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A button shown at the bottom right of your screen. We will try our best to answer these at the end of the session. I would like to introduce our first speaker today, Siobhan Cross, you have the floor. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining this webinar this morning. Um, my name, as Liz has said, is Siobhan Cross, and I'm a partner in the property team at Prince St. Mason's. In July, we published a guide to net zero carbon real estate, where we tried to look at the various action strands involved in achieving net zero carbon real estate, very much as we're lawyers from the perspective of showing the legal and policy drivers for net zero carbon real estate and the legal issues and the legal services involved in that journey. It covered the whole life cycle of the building from construction, planning, finance, um, through to the operational phase of the building and the end of life and possible repurposing issues around the end of the life of the building. Um, it included, of course, a section on low carbon and renewable energy and property. And today is the first of two webinars in which we're delving deeper into the issues covered in that guide. And as um, we've said, today's session is on low carbon and renewable energy and property. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I just wanted to touch briefly on the regulatory and policy context that real estate in the UK is operating under in this arena. We know at the top line level, we have a legally binding commitment to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050 and following parliamentary adoption of the sixth carbon budget this summer, um, a 78% reduction in emissions by 2035 would be required to meet that budget. Real estate has to some extent lagged behind other sectors in decarbonising. Um, the reduction in UK emissions thus far has largely come from the energy sector. I think the transport sector now has a clearer roadmap, um, leaving real estate sector as a big emitter of emissions, but without that clearer roadmap for actually decarbonising energy used in buildings. What we have so far in the regulatory field is largely around energy efficiency and energy use in buildings rather than the source of that energy. Um, and that at the moment comprises of the EPC regime, energy performance certificate regime, um, applicable on sales, lettings, new builds. And um, that energy performance certificate regime underpins the other piece of the jigsaw we have, which is around minimum energy efficiency standards on letting of domestic and commercial property. At the moment, only an EPCE is required for letting. And we do have some reporting requirements under the streamlined energy and carbon reporting scheme, which do require emissions reporting. So not much that actually deals with the source of energy in buildings. And on the basis of government consultations we've had and announcements, we can see that coming down the road, we are likely to have, or we hope we're gonna have improvements in the quality of EPCs. We're going to have a significant ramping up of the requirements for minimum energy efficiency standards on lettings to C grades by 2025 for the residential lettings and to B grades by 2030 for commercial lettings. But again, an EPC is looking at the fabric and services of the building and not at the source of energy. And also this year, we've had a consultation on the possible introduction of a performance-based rating for industrial and commercial property, which would apply only to buildings of a thousand, more than 1,000 square meters. And the government's preferred metric for that rating um, does indicate that there will be some adverse effect of fossil fuel use in that rating. So we begin to get near the source of energy for a building. Um, one area in which the source of energy for a building is relevant in, in possible future regulations that the government has signalled is around future home standards and future building standards, which are going to tighten part L of the building regulations. And the aim of that legislation is not reduction in energy use, um, uh, predominantly, which has been the aim of the other regulations I've talked about, but reduction in emissions. So from that, you can see that the missing part of the jigsaw is any actual requirement for decarbonisation of energy in existing buildings. The Energy White Paper proposes that we will have transitioned to a clean energy system by 2050. The Climate Change Committee in their annual report on progress in June this year 
heavily recommended the phase out of oil and gas heating by 2028 and asked the government to set clear signals and timeframes for the phase out of gas heating. But we are, of course, still waiting for the missing piece of the jigsaw, the heat and building strategy, which should begin to, I think, tackle decarbonisation of energy in property. Meanwhile, of course, there are other drivers than regulatory ones for the transition to net zero carbon buildings. And today we'll look at those and the options for procuring low carbon and renewable energy. Um, there will be time for questions at the end and you can use the Q&A function on the screen to submit any questions. Um, so now, finally, to introduce our speakers, I'm delighted that we're joined today by James Constable from Beringa Partners, um, management consultants in the, um, energy, amongst other things. And James will give us an overview of the drivers for and options for low carbon and renewable energy. Uh, James is an expert in decarbonisation, low carbon heating, renewable energy and energy efficiency with over 10 years experience in advising a range of corporates from startups to FTSE 100 companies. Then my colleague Ronan Lamb will look at power purchase agreements. Ronan's a partner in our energy team and specialises in advising renewable developers and lenders and large corporates on a range of electricity offtake solutions, including private wire and corporate PPAs. And he's advised clients such as BT and Orsted and has advised on the largest offshore wind corporate PPA in Europe to date. Then my colleague Rona Kostulin will look at on-site generation. Rona's a partner in Pinsett Mason's dedicated energy and infrastructure property team. She's been advising clients in the energy and real estate sector for over 17 years on a wide range of renewable projects and has huge experience in dealing with the property aspects of those projects, fitting the energy solutions into the real estate sphere. She's acted for, amongst others, Tesco's, Nissan, Aviva, Harworth and BP. And finally, my colleague Jeremy Chang um, will look at heat networks. Jeremy is also a partner in our energy team and has 15 years experience in advising on energy projects and transactions with a particular focus on advising on decentralized energy projects, including heat networks. Jeremy started his career in the energy sector at Ofgem, the regulator, advising on their duties and um, major market reforms at the time he was there. So enough from me and I will pass over to James to give us an overview of the drivers for and routes to low carbon and renewable options in real estate. Hi everyone, thanks Yvonne. Um, yeah, um, really thank, uh, good to be here and um, hopefully this is interesting. Um, I've got 10 minutes so I'm going to be relatively rapid um, but really what I'm trying to do here is frame the problem so that hopefully we can have some interesting Q&A and set up the rest of the speakers um, just when we dive into some more detail. So next slide please. Okay so I think Siobhan's already done a pretty good job of setting the scene um, but just going to do that visually. So, so what I've done here is I won't cover it in too much detail because again we've just covered it but, but really there's mounting pressure at a corporate level um, ESG finance is a wave of that coming in, you know, which is affecting both you and your, you know, your investors or your tenants investors to decarbonize their position across scopes one, two, and three. And we'll cover that in a sec. And what I've done here is just put on some of, you know, the, the kind of the, the major corporate, um, within the commercial real estate sector who, who are kind of setting their zero targets who have done that publicly at least. Um, and we're not seeing you know, super early movers in this market, but we're also not seeing some of the laggards that we're seeing um, in other sectors, um, although there are different challenges in different in different markets. So Landsec, Aviva and JLL have all set um, zero targets for 2040. And I think the most important thing here is um, to get the curve as steep as possible, as early as possible. So what does that mean? So it basically means doing as much as you can now so that you can realistically hit that target later, especially if you're thinking about signing up to science-based targets, which is a more kind of arguably aggressive um, target um, uh, process, which kind of aligns you with, with a 1.5 degree scenario. So any questions on that, obviously give me a shout. So just very quickly, I want to cover what, we, what do we mean by scopes one, two, and three in that Net, um, net, net emissions reporting, so we can help contextualize this. So, next slide, please. 
Okay, cool. So just for just just to get everyone up to speed. So what do we mean when we talk about decarbonisation? So scope one, that is effectively emissions produced on site. So for this sector, it's probably a backup generator. Um, is, is, is a good example of something that's going to create scope one emissions. Also, if you own um, and you don't subcontract, you actually own your own transport fleet, any of those transport fuels that can capture scope one as well. So scope two for this sector is, is pretty significant, and that is your in imported power. OK, so that's the, the carbon intensity of the power that you buy from the grid you use from the grid so that means that we care a lot about how carbon intensive the you know the uk is or other markets you're operating in are and then scope three is uh captures all of your um supply chain emissions and any um use of product so a good example of that being if i am um, a phone manufacturer and i sell a phone if someone's charging that phone then the power used to charge that phone is included in my scope three, although it's not me doing it, it's part of my whole end-to-end uh, -end impact. And then net emissions includes any um, uh, kind of accountable certificates that you use, that, sorry, that you, that, you, that you generate. For example, um, if you invest in renewables and you're given by Ofgem what's called a renewable energy guarantee of origin, a certificate to say you produce one megawatt hour of power, Great job. If you retain that um, and retire it and, and, and instead of selling it to, a, for example, a supplier, you can use that to offset your net emissions position. So that's a very that's a whistle stop tour of carbon accounting for you. OK, next slide, please. And then this is like a framework that we use um, we've used with multiple, multiple corporates and we use with multiple clients to just get the conversation moving around how you are going to decarbonize your portfolio, your business, your estate, your tenant, whatever. So what we've got here is three broad areas. So reduce energy demand. And what we really mean here is energy efficiency. As Siobhan said, we've got a legally binding target by 2023 here. So if you've got an E rated property by 2023, you can't let it. It's very likely that the government's going to set a B rating target by 2030 and that that's going to be stepped. So, you know, C by 2030, B by 20. 30, um, 35, et cetera, you know, sorry, by 2020, by, by 2025, and that, that's going to get increasingly aggressive. And then when we look at green energy demand. So that is um, investing or contracting with private wire solar, building on site storage, fuel switching. So, not, um, so, so moving, for example, to, to, to compressed um, LNG or moving to buy biofuels or EV, um, and then looking at demand side response. So how do I use my power? And then on the green energy supply, that is where I can't physically do something with an asset. So invest in a new asset, build a new thing. And actually now I'm looking at my contracting strategy with green assets. So this is not linked to site. This is all financial or synthetic contractual um, arrangements, e.g. a corporate power purchase agreement which we'll talk on, I'm sure. So what do we think is important here? We think it's really, really important to have a plan and a strategy. And, and it's important to note, this is different to um, setting net zero targets. So it's, it's, it's one thing to set your carbon reduction target and to put that out there in the world. It's a completely another, it's a completely different thing to have a very clear strategy with how you're going to um, finance commercially, structure and deliver that decarbonisation and most importantly capture the financial um, and brand opportunity that's on the table. So a lot of corporates just leaving value on the table because they're just not aware of what they can do, the art of the possible in this space. We see it as an opportunity, this isn't a tax, this isn't something that you have to pay for that has to be net negative to you. Um, we see it as an opportunity. The next slide please. So next level down, a bit more detail. So commercial property assets and portfolios are in a really interesting position between their tenant and the energy services market. So we think they're really well positioned centrally to deliver energy services to their clients, to their tenants. Uh, but, but that is subject to 
um, you know, risk appetite, obviously, your, your tenure of your tenancy on your portfolio, your current hedging strategy for power, etc. lots and lots of things. However, we still believe that you are well positioned. So what kinds of things can we do? So we can look at putting a development agreement in place with a renewables developer to, to, to facilitate private wire, so hardwired solar into your estate. You need a large load. You can aggregate with other demand centers locally, that's possible, um, it, but it's not gonna be applicable for every scenario. And where it's not, we can look at either blending or um, and doing instead of an off-site renewable strategy, there's corporate PPA, there's, you can do that with operational assets, you can do that with new assets. We can look at um, financials and so kind of synthetic products. Um, cross geographies, loads to talk about there. And then on the heating side, especially in urban environments, district heating is increasingly an opportunity, we, we believe, for commercial property asset owners, portfolio owners. So. Um, you know, we do a lot of work with um, district heating developers, and I've worked with one, and happy to talk with that. And we've got Jeremy on the phone as well, so lots of kind of expertise here on on that. But also outside of urban environments, you know, ground source heat pumps, air source heat pumps, lots of noise in the market, lots of interesting non-commodity policy switching from power to gas, and the counterfactual is going to get more interesting there. Clean transport, so EVs, so you know, why can a commercial property portfolio owner not provide this as a service to tenants, provide this as a service to, you know, for footfall for retail. Um, there's a V2G model there that's really interesting. But ultimately, what we, th what we think is this can all run through the existing tenancy agreement. And if you look at what's happening in America, you've got green leases, green tenancy leases. If you look at what's happening in New York, this is how they are bridging in America the gap, which the, there's always been the issue in the sector of how do I make this work? when I have a landlord and a tenant and a tenancy agreement, and I have DLAPs to deal with, I have tenancy negotiations to deal with, how do we make that work? And could a green lease be a way of um, finally unlocking this for the sector? That's me. Great, thanks. Thanks, James. Um, morning, all. Um, so my name is Ronan Lam. I'm a partner in the energy team at Vincent Masons. Um, and just, I'm gonna pick up on a couple of things that James uh, mentioned in his slides um, and delve into them in a little bit more detail, um, specifically the, the topic of power purchase agreements. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide. Um, so James mentioned um, on-site generation and, and corporate PPAs as potential means of achieving scope one and two reductions. So over the next few slides, I'm just gonna explain what what power purchase agreements are, what corporate PPAs are, why you should be considering them, and which power purchase agreement structure might be the right one for you. Um, put, put very simply, a, a power purchase agreement or a PPA is just a, it's a contract whereby one party, and we're gonna call them the, the building owner uh, in the next few slides, uh, buys electricity directly from the generator of that electricity. Um, so you can look to purchase electricity from a project which is already in operation, uh, but if you're looking to demonstrate additionality, which we're sort of increasingly seeing as the, the gold standard here, um, that electricity is going to come from a new project. Now, PPAs are important because they, they offer a range of benefits which the building owner won't get uh, from simply signing up to a green electricity tariff from its electricity supplier. And these you know, these are the benefits that you know James was alluding to in terms of things that quite often um, you know corporates are, are sort of leaving behind and are not really realizing um, you know how much they can they can they can make value from them. But they include the ability to obviously fix the cost of a critical commodity, i.e., electricity, something which can then be passed on to tenants, or the the, the value sharing can be can be or the value um, uh, can be shared with tenants. And, and during periods of high wholesale electricity prices, like we're currently experiencing, that, that can obviously be of considerable value to the building owner and tenants alike. Um, but these structures also help contribute to the building owner and its tenants ESG and carbon reduction targets. They facilitate differentiation from competitors. Uh, so they allow building owners to attract top tier tenants who may have their own, uh, you know, sustainability targets uh, and, and that might drive who they, who they, uh, 
look to as, as, as their landlord. And finally, they, they demonstrate a tangible and, and credibly sustainable procurement choice to investors, to customers, to employees, to tenants, uh, something which, as James mentioned, is coming under increased scrutiny. So if we move on to the next slide, we're just going to run through uh, three of the, the typical PPA structures just to explain how they work. Um, there are a myriad of variations of these out there, but we'll, we'll, we'll focus on just the kind of core three structures for now. The first one is the simplest. Um, so this is the on-site or private wire PPA. Um, it's the type of structure that's used, for example, where a third party is installing and operating solar panels on the roof of a property, or a wind farm developer is connecting its wind farm directly to the property via private wire. Private wire is James context means a hardwired cable which doesn't form part of the wider electricity grid. So here the developer of the generating project is selling its electricity that it generates to the building owner. That electricity is accompanied by the regos which, which James mentioned and these are certificates which provide evidence that the electricity is coming from a renewable source. The building owner will maintain its electricity supply contract with its regular electricity supplier. So it has certainty that it will always have electricity available if you know the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. Although it's worth noting that uh, storage and batteries in particular have an increasing role to play here in, in helping smooth the, uh, the troughs that are associated with those forms of generation. Any electricity that's generated by the generator, which isn't consumed by the building owner, is then sold by that generator by the grid. The key enabler for this structure is land. So whether it's a suitable roof space for solar panels or land nearby to put wind turbines on or put some biogeneration on. Um, and, and it's noteworthy because it, it can result in the highest cost savings uh, since the electricity is consumed close to where it's generated and it avoids a number of the costs which would otherwise be incurred if it was being supplied by the grid. Um, it is worth sounding a note of caution, though, around these structures. Um, government has recently held a call for evidence on the regulatory treatment of them, and it's possible that some of the cost savings available today may be reduced in the future, so it's one to keep an eye on. We go to the next slide, please. So this next structure is known as the synthetic or virtual or financial PPA. It's got a number of different names, uh, and it's slightly more complex than the last one, but has a key advantage. Um, so here, the building owner doesn't need to make any land available for the project to be built on. Um, in fact, it can be used where the generator's project is in a totally different location from the building owner, even at the other end of the country. And in fact, in, in, in certain markets, it in, in you know, can, be, can be cited in a different state. So in this structure, the building owner and the generator enter into a PPA, which is, in essence, a, a contract for difference or a swap of one electricity price for another. And this allows the building owner to gain certainty around the electricity price which it will pay and also provides the generator with certainty around the electricity price it will receive. So the parties agree one price in their PPA, which is known as the strike price. And if the price which the generator receives when it sells its physical electricity into the market is less than that strike price, then the building owner is required to pay the generator the difference. So it tops up. And then the converse is also true. So when the price that the generator receives for selling its physical electricity exceeds that strike price, the difference between the two is paid to the building owner. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, this structure is known as the, the sleeved or sort of physical PPA. Um, and it's arguably the most complex, but is, is the most common one used uh, on so-called corporate PPAs in the UK where generator and building owner are not uh, not physically um, located together. And it works by having the generator and building owner enter into one PPA, whereby the building owner is buying electricity and regos from the generator. And that, that electricity and those regos are effectively then unsold by the building owner to its electricity supplier. And the electricity supplier for a fee makes that electricity available to the building owner at its various consumption sites through its existing electricity supply contract via process known as sleeving. So this structure can work particularly well where you have a number of different buildings that are going to need to use 
the electricity, uh, all buying that electricity from a wind farm or solar park located somewhere else in the, in the country. Move on to the next slide. Yeah, assessing what structure is right for you, there's, there's definitely an exercise to be done. And, and, and I think that the, the emphasis we'd place here is, is to, to try to do that as early as possible. And, and you know, e each of the structures that I've mentioned on, on the previous slides come with pros and cons. Um, and, and we would always advise any building owner or any property company looking to, you know, considering entering into a PPA as part of its energy strategy, to sit down early and, and seek the right advice. Um, and we, we'd usually be pointing them in the direction of James at Bringa or, or, or another you know, specialist energy markets and strategy consultant uh, who can help them assess you know, which of these models is likely to deliver best, best value for them. Um, it's also fair to say that you know, as your sort of PPA journey progresses, it's very likely you're gonna need some, probably some technical advice and legal and accounting advice on, on any structure that you uh, look to implement. So we move on to the next slide. I thought I'd just leave you with some issues that are probably worth considering um, if PPAs are of interest to you, uh, and specifically that, that may be of interest to, to, to property owners and building owners. Um, the first is term. Um, typically, in our experience, generators are looking for a, for a term of the PPA of about 10 to 20 years. Um, the reason for that is it provides, this contract's going to provide the generator with the certainty of revenue that they need in order to convince their investors or, or, or lenders, if they're using debt, to provide the capital required to build their project. Um, and as they're going to need to repay that money over the term of the PPA, they're quite often reluctant to grant the building owner rights to break that PPA or reduce the amount of electricity that's purchased over time. Or, or if they do grant those rights, there's going to be a big financial penalty to pay. So that can limit the flexibility which the building owner has to change how it uses that building over time. The second issue to consider is regulation. Uh, regulatory issues are felt most strongly on the private wire and on-site PPA structures because those are using uh, or seeking to take advantage from exemptions from the requirements to hold various types of electricity license. As you can imagine, electricity is highly regulated um, and it's imperative that a, a regulatory analysis is done early on any private wire or on-site structure to make sure that it fits within the rules. The consequences of getting this wrong are, are considerable. Um, supplying electricity without a license or an applicable exemption is a criminal offence. So one to just take a lot of care with. The third is credit support. Um, the generator is totally reliant effectively on the credit of the building owner for all the revenues coming into its project. And even if it's not using external debt to finance that project, in our experience, unless the building owner signing the PPA has a high investment grade itself, uh, it's going to need to put forward a parent company guarantee or letter of credit from an appropriately rated bank uh, in favor of the generator to, to back off its obligation to pay for power. The last point is change of control. Um, so as I've noted already, PPAs tend to be long-term and many generators operate on a model of developing projects and selling them on to other categories of asset holder once they're built and de-risked. So the generators typically want to preserve the maximum flexibility to sell their projects during the PPA term. And there can be tension here with the building owner who has got comfortable with the party it's contracting with and may not want to see that project fall into the hands of certain categories of investor, perhaps its competitors, for example. But equally, on the flip side, um, given the importance of the PPA revenue stream to its project, the generator is likely to have some concerns if the building owner wants to sell its property and transfer the PPA to another counterparty. So in these circumstances, the generator is likely to require any incoming counterparty to the PPA, any, any purchaser of the property, to fulfill minimum credit criteria, you know, not be on a sanctions list and not be a competitor of the generator. So there can be a little bit of tension, uh, tension there. Um, I'm now going to pass over to my colleague, Rona Kostulin, who's going to explain some of the property structures behind the typical on-site and private wire PPA structures that I've mentioned. Thanks very much, Ronan. Um, 
Yep, so as um, Ronan says, I'm Rona Kostulin. I am a partner in the dedicated energy property team at Vincent Mason's. Um, I'm going to cover some of the PPA and lease structures for the installation of on-site electricity generating plant. And then I'll also look at some of the key features of leases with um, on-site generators. So um, firstly, PPA and lease structures. Um, I should start by saying here that I'm not talking about corporate PPAs, which Ronan mentioned, where the electricity is generated at a different location to the location where it's consumed. Um, I'm talking here about private wire PPAs where the electricity is generated on site, either by the building owner um, <clears throat> or by a separate generator. So um, a building owner may want to install and retain ownership of the plant. And where that's the case, um, there are various potential structures. Um, I've set out some of those structures on the following slides. So if we look at the first one here, um, firstly, in an owner occupier scenario, the building owner can install the plant and use the electricity that's generated from it and can also then sell any excess onto the grid. Then if we move on to the next slide, and um, the second slide here shows the same structure, but with occupational tenants in place. Um, so where this is the case, the occupation, where the occupational lease is of the whole of the property, um, the building owner would need to agree a surrender of part and variation to the occupational lease to allow for the installation of the plant. Um, and then they can deal with the supply of the electricity in the lease variation or um, in a separate PPA. Then if we move on to the next slide, the third structure shows the scenario where the building owner sets up a group company SPV and grants a lease to that SPV to allow it to install and operate the plant. Um, that SPV then enters into PPAs with the various occupational tenants to sell the electricity to them. Now, it may be the case that the building owner doesn't want to incur the capital expenditure of installing the plant and um, may not want the responsibility of maintaining it. And so instead may want to contract with a generator who would then install, own and operate the plant. Where that's the case, again, there are various potential structures that can be put in place. Um, I've covered a couple of those on the following slides. So if we could move on to the next slide, thank you. So firstly, where the building owner is an owner occupier, it can enter into a lease with the generator to allow the generator to install and operate the plant. And um, the building owner also then enters into a PPA with the generator for the supply of the electricity. Then if we move to the next slide. Um, where there are occupational tenants, then if the occupational leases are of the whole of the property, the building owner would need to enter into deeds of surrender of parts and variation with the occupational tenants. Um, the supply of the electricity onto those occupational tenants could then be dealt with in those variations or in separate PPA documents. And as Ronan mentioned earlier, um, there is a fairly complex regulatory regime um, in relation to the supply of electricity. And this can affect particularly the onward supply of electricity to tenants. Um, and that does need to be considered when looking to put this type of structure in place. Finally, it's worth mentioning that um, tenants of buildings may want to install electricity generating plant either themselves or by contracting with a generator. Um, this can involve lease variations, landlord consents, um, if the tenants are installing the plant themselves or indeed the grants of subleases where the tenant is contracting with the generator. Um, if we move on to the following slide, um, I thought it would be useful just to touch on some of the key features of leases that are put in place with the generators. So firstly, um, 
the term of the lease. Now that tends to be 20 to 25 years. Um, but would tend to have break rights or automatic termination contained in it um, because it will go hand in hand with the PPA that it sits alongside. Um, and as Ronan mentioned earlier, those tend to be 10 to 20 years. The, uh, the rent in the leases would typically be a nominal rent. Um, the reason for that being that the building owner um, takes its benefit from the fixed price electricity rather than from any um, commercial rent. In terms of the repair provisions in the lease, um, typically um, where you're talking about rooftop solar, for example, the repair of the roof would sit with the building owner. Um, they would be obliged to keep the roof in a condition that was suitable to support the panels. Um, and then the panels themselves would be the responsibility of the panel owners. You often in the leases um, see an obligation for temporary removal of the equipment um, that can be required um, to allow the building owner to carry out roof repairs or indeed repairs to other parts of the building. Um, in terms of insurance, um, Typically speaking, the obligation in respect of insurance for the building itself um, remains with the building owner and the insurance for the plant is dealt with separately by the generator and owner of the plant. Um, then finally, it's worth just touching on landlord covenants and restrictions. So often the developers or generators will want to restrict what the landowners um, can do um, in and around the building and on land neighbouring the building so that they can protect um, light or wind flow, depending whether it's solar or wind, reaching the, the panels or the turbines. Um, now, owners often don't want to be um, restricted in what they can do, um, and, and that can be dealt with through compensation provisions in the PPA if needs be. And um, so those were the main points I wanted to touch on. So. I'll just pass over now to Jeremy Chang on district heating networks. Thank you. Thanks, Rona. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, as Siobhan mentioned, I'm Jeremy Chang. I'm a uh, partner in our energy team focusing on decentralized energy projects. And um, a large part of my practice is advising on heat networks. Um, it's, it's a market that I've been involved in for about um, probably about 10 years now. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to start off by giving you a very brief recap about what a heat network is. So apologies um, if you're already familiar with what they are, but I thought it would be um, a helpful way to set the scene. Um, so a heat network comes in all shapes and sizes, but the essential characteristics are uh, heat is generated from a central source and supplied to consumers via pipeline system. This, of course, avoids the need for individual boilers or, or electric heaters in every unit or building. And the central source of heat is often referred to as the energy center. Um, and now there are, there are many possible technologies that can provide heat. But uh, perhaps the most common form of generation that we come across is, is probably gas-fired combined heat and power. Having said that, um, other technologies are now being looked at more actively, uh, such as heat pumps, as James referred to earlier, or other or other sources of heat, such as waste heat from from an energy from waste plant. Once generated, the heat is then brought into each unit through a heat exchanger or, or, or heat interface unit. And, and to just give you a, a bit of a feel for the size of that um, in a residential unit, the heat exchanger is, is probably about the same size as a small gas boiler. Now, when we talk about heat networks, we, we might normally think of them in the context of a network serving a new build residential or mixed use development. But of course, that's not always the case. Uh, we've worked on projects uh, which have been conceived on a citywide scale and also in the industrial and commercial space where heat is provided in the form of steam uh, to be used as part of a manufacturing or other industrial process. Next slide, please. Thanks. Now, <clears throat> the UK heat market is much smaller, I think it's fair to say, 
than in some of our European and Scandinavian neighbours where heat networks are much more commonplace. But for a while now, we've been seeing a growing focus on heat networks due to the government's recognition of the contribution that they can make to achieving net zero. Uh, uh, about um, half our total spend is on heating homes and buildings, and if deployed at sufficient scale, heat networks could reduce CO2 by 700,000 tonnes a year, saving 3,000 gigawatt hours of gas imports a year. And the importance of heat networks uh, was underscored by the Climate Change Committee um, in its report published in uh, May 2019. The committee recognised that heat networks are uh, perhaps most effective in high density built up areas such as city centres or, or new build developments. And if, if deployed in the right way, will play an important role in achieving net zero, irrespective of which decarbonisation pathway we follow. The committee estimated that up to 5 million homes will need to be connected to heat networks by 2050. And this is up from the current position of around, of around 40,000 heat networks um, in the UK and about five, just under 500,000 connections in total. All of this is to say, you know, given where we are now and where we want to get to, there is a long way to go. And of course, the government has taken steps to encourage deployment of heat networks. Um, to give you a couple of examples, M most recently, uh, the government introduced uh, HNIP or the Heat Networks Investment Project, um, which is a £320 million fund set up to provide funding for early stage development of heat networks. In fact, um, HNIP is due to close this year and is going to be replaced. Uh, by the Green Heat Network Fund, which we launched in full in April next year and make available, um, I think it's around £270 million worth of funding. However, there's a, however, there's a lot more that can be done. Um, as the Climate Change Committee noted in its most recent progress report in June, there remain gaps in the government's ambition in relation to low carbon heat networks. Siobhan's already mentioned that we've been promised a heat and building strategy, which may plug some of these policy gaps, but, but its publication has been delayed um, by around a year already, although it is hoped that the, strate that the strategy will be published before COP26, so, so perhaps imminently, so definitely one to watch. I should also flag, actually, last Thursday, the Scottish Government published its heat and building strategy. That contains 111 recommendations aimed at delivering the Scottish Government's vision um, that uh, ensures that homes and buildings are no longer contributing to climate change by, by 2045. And of course, although it's wider in scope than just heat networks, uh, the Government is prioritising their deployment alongside heat pumps in the near term. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, <clears throat> if the heat market needs to grow rapidly uh, to achieve net zero, then we can expect that developers who may not have previously thought about installing a heat network may now start to do so. This could be on a standalone basis or implemented alongside a holistic package of measures, which might include on-site generation and corporate PPAs, which, which Ronan and Rona have already touched upon. Now, what we try to do on this slide is to draw together some of the considerations a developer might, a developer might need to take into account when considering um, whether to install a heat network. I think the first thing to say is that, in fact, sometimes the developer may not actually have a choice. And this is because its planning permission may require it to connect its development to a heat network. And, and frankly, in our experience, this is in fact a key driver for the uptake of connections to heat networks. So, for example, um, London has planning requirements that favour heat networks. Under the London plan, um, the mayor um, expects, I think, around 25% of heat and power used in London to be generated through the use of decentralised energy systems. And going forward, <clears throat> excuse me, we might ex expect um, a further promotion of heat networks through the development of heat network zones. So last Friday, the government consulted on proposals to identify and designate zones within which heat networks are the lowest cost, um, low carbon solution for decarbonizing heat. Under the proposals, 
Um, very broadly speaking, if you're developing certain buildings within these zones, you will be required to connect to a heat network unless exempt. In Scotland, um, the Heat Network Scotland Act, which received royal assent in March this year, already contains proposals for the development of heat zones. Putting planning to one side, um, you know, uh, another consideration will be the introduction of the future homes and the future building standard, uh, which Vaughan mentioned earlier, and that will require developers to consider more seriously connecting to uh, low carbon heat networks as part of um, uh, they're designed to deliver more energy efficient buildings in the future. Um, and, and from a, from, from a consumer perspective, um, one benefit of heat networks is that they can enjoy lower prices because heat networks can capture economies of scale by generating heat in one large plant rather than heat being generated by individual boilers and units. Um, on top of that, heat contracts often also con uh, contain benchmarking protection to ensure that heat prices cannot be increased excessively. And more broadly, um, consumers can take comfort from the fact that the market has developed arrangements to protect their interests, notably the heat trust. Um, now, that was set up by the Association of Decentralized Energy, and uh, it's the world's first voluntary heat customer protection scheme. It sets out standards of performance, which are which are broadly similar to those enjoyed by gas and electricity customers, as well as implementing a complaints mechanism to the energy ombudsman. And going forward, there are of course plans to regulate the sector. In England and Wales, we're waiting for the government's response to its consultation on the policy options for the development of a regulatory framework. Scotland is in fact further ahead. Um, as mentioned before, the Heat Network Scotland Act 2021 sets out a framework for, among other things, um, uh, heat network licences to regulate behaviours. Um, although uh, I, I recall much of the detail will, will ultimately be set out in secondary legislation. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, now, this slide sets out some of the things you might want to think about if you've taken the decision to implement a heat network. Our experience suggests that it's, it's important to spend time planning early on so that the network is implemented um, in, on time and, and in a coordinated way with, with the wider development build out. Now, the thing to remember, implementing heat networks isn't like procuring other utilities such as gas and power. They can be contract heavy uh, with no commonly applied standard forms. And as a result, um, we've sometimes found that heat network projects can become complex and can take some time to negotiate. So it's important to build that into your, your time scales. And just to give you a flavor of some of the issues that often come up, um, a key feature of heat network heat network projects is that the the energy service provider or ESCO will require exclusivity to serve the development as, as um, certainty of demand underpins the financial viability of the project. This means that uh, the ESCO is basically a monopoly of the site and it's very difficult for uh, or, or indeed impossible for customers to go anywhere else. So for developers, this means it's important to ensure that there are controls over the, for the, over the ESCO's behavior from safeguarding the interest of consumers to ensuring that the ESCO looks after the energy infrastructure properly. There are often detailed arrangements uh, which deal with ESCO's performance, how they are incentivized and, and what happens if they fail to perform. Another potential area to consider is ensuring that the, the delivery of the heat network dovetails with the, de the developers' um, plans for the wider development. So, for example, if um, the developer is thinking about selling off plots to third parties, how should the contractual arrangements be set up to ensure that the plot developer also connects to the heat network? Um, I wanted to touch upon um, exit as as um, Often there are a bunch of issues that um, can cause discussion. Uh, the first thing to say is that a developer may well want to exit the project once the development is built out. So 
you'll want to make sure that the heat contracts allow allow that to happen without restriction. Um, in that sin, uh, situation, commonly the contracts uh, may then be handed over to a manco, and the issue for the ESCO will be how to get comfortable with this. Um, you know, such as um, manco's financial standing or or its ability to share share certain costs. On the flip side, um, what ha what happens on expiry or early termination of the heat contracts? Should compensation on termination be payable? And if so, in what circumstances? What is the solution for ensuring ongoing heat supplies? Will will a new service provider be appointed? <clears throat> and if so, what's the process for ensuring an orderly handover? Um, I think that's probably all I was trying to say about heat networks, but if I can perhaps leave you with one final thought, it's that we found that all heat projects are different. Each will have its own specific risks and priorities, uh, and they will all have to be sort of considered in the round and addressed within the contract structure. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Siobhan for the, for the panel section. Um, many thanks. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you to all our speakers. Um, I wondered if I could start with a question for James, and maybe Ronan will come in after that. Um, I just wondered what the key issues, the key factors are in deciding if a PPA is the right option for a corporate, and how you know the the, the, the kind of risk areas, the things to make clear off at, at early doors to make sure that the project proceeds swiftly and without problems. Yes, um, big question. Um, I'll try and be as concise as I can. So, um, I think where we've seen it, things go wrong is really in uh, you know, two factors. Where number one, where the counterparty, so in this situation, um, commercial real estate portfolio, is unclear on their risk position. So, what I mean by that is. Um, what risks you're willing to take on, what you would like to see maybe dealt with via a third party, e.g. a supplier taking on risk and all the, the, the developer. And those risks are broadly commodity. So who's going to take um, the, kind of the commodity and volume risk? Then there's the shape risk. So renewables don't you know, produce power um, uh, in a perfect way, right? They're, they're intermittent. So you're not going to get base perfect base load power. So there's an element of shape risk. So the supplier usually or often will kind of help um, hedge that out for you. But sometimes you need to take some of that risk on. There's imbalance risk as well. So who's who's going to be out um, out of pocket if, um, if, if if again if we aren't if we aren't perfectly hedged or things that go according to plan? And then the regulatory risk as well. So if rex change, etc. So so that's that's. The, the, there are the kind of the broad categories of risk that you have to really think about when using Google Risk. That's one element. And the other element really is the developer and development itself. So um, how um, you know what's its what's its route to market for finance? Um, how credible is the developer? Track record. Um, if just are you going to work well with them? Uh, you know, it's some of the you know, more human side of of the deal. So we we do a lot of work on the so strategy. Um, kind of getting that aligned, and then um, and then kind of overseeing the commercial advisory on on the implementation of that as well. But does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Ronan, I don't know if you had anything to add to that. I mean, I would I'd echo what James is saying. I mean, again, think, thinking about where we've seen things not go necessarily according to plan, it's probably been in two areas. One, the the the, the internal sort of stakeholder education and mapping piece for for the energy consumer so you know lo looking at who who are you going to need ultimately to sign off on this structure who's going to need to be comfortable with it um you know if you've got c suite support that that tends to smooth things through and the most successful structures we've seen have tended to have a, a cfo or someone like that you know lend, lending their support and being quite involved and then the other piece is absolutely the diligence piece around the underlying project that you're looking at you're looking at contracting with um you know as, as james said you know are, are you talking to a credible developer have they have they done this type of thing before have they got reference projects that they can they can point to um because it can be very disappointing to sort of get quite far down the line 
with a developer having negotiated a PPA only for that project to, you know, maybe not get planning or something like that, which can, you know, just put you on the back foot and maybe put you off these structures uh, for, for a long time. So I think diligence, external diligence and your own internal sort of stakeholder mapping piece are, are, are critical. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks both. And Rona, I wondered if I could ask you, you talked about um, on-site energy projects, possibly restricting a property owner's freedom around what they could do with their property. And I just wondered if you could say anything about ways around that problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this can be a point of contention because obviously um, building owners are, are keen to maintain flexibility and to be able to do what they need to do and want to do um, with regard to that building and also um, neighbouring land. Whereas the developers um, will be keen to protect the, the sunlight or the wind that's reaching the, um, the plant. Um, and um, where the building owner really is keen to keep that flexibility, um, then you can set up um, compensation provisions through the PPA document. So, for example, have minimum purchase amounts which apply regardless of um, whether the the plant has been affected or not so there's certainly there are ways around it and there are ways of ensuring that building owners can maintain complete flexibility in what they can do with their building going forward great thank you so much and i think i've got time for one final question and it, probably for james but please anyone else feel free to answer i just wondered if you could um comment on the things we've discussed today in the light of the current sort of energy pricing crisis that we're seeing and whether that creates a further driver or is a is a reason for pausing on any energy projects people are thinking about um, massive another massive question so yeah, that's sorry. Why, so um <laughs> it, it really depends what you're doing so if you took an example right so if you're building a to say 30 megawatt private wire solar farm Okay, into a large shopping center or something like that. So, a private wire project. Um, your counterfactuals, so the economics you're uh, built around that project, are the avoidance of the non commodity element of um, power. So, roughly 60%, right? Um, well, previously, 60% of, um, of, of the what we call the retail cost stack. So, if I am now at a position where pulse hub power has gone from 40 pound per megawatt hour up to kind of 200 sometimes or very close to a thousand in the day ahead market subject to what day you're looking at, which is all driven un underlyingly by low wind and high uh, gas costs from availability constraints. So that's the macro. Um, so the economics of that project um, are now great yeah. today, but it's a long-term view. So we, we do a lot of work on wholesale power, power market forecasts and you have to take a view on, um, you know, it, it's, it's a bit like investing. You, you can't use short-term market volatility to anchor your bias on what's gonna happen medium to long-term. So we still believe with market fundamentals and um, that being driver for power market forecasting. Um, lots of projects are reconsidering their economics right now. You know, if you look at the other, the other side of the coin, if you look at corporate PPA. So um, what you could argue is that developers are now hiking their corporate PPA price expectation in line with a short term um, what I believe is a short, uh, and it's my belief, not bringer belief, but a short term, so I say kind of nine month horizon where wholesale prices are increased. So that's why you need to have, you know, in my opinion, a market expert alongside you and a contracting expert alongside you to help kind of fight the battle with the developer because they're going to say, oh, well, you're, you know, today it's going to be a fantastic saving, but actually previous to this wholesale price increase, um, prices were lower. So, you know, it, this is normal in any market, this happens, right? Um, but it's, it's so just, there's the other thing that's probably worth noting is, I don't know if you guys have seen the FT recently, there's, it's not unofficial, right? But there's talk 
about elements of the power non-commodity stack moving onto gas. So everything that Jeremy's just been talking about there, it starts to make the counterfactual for um, you know, peak decarbonization more uh, or sorry, less competitive. So that's being that's that's gas, right? Everyone's got a gas boiler. Okay. So if you want to electrify heat, for example. Um, or decarbonize heat, you're competing with, you know, 13 pence, 14 pence for kilowatt hour for power versus three to four P for gas. Okay, well, you know, it's not going to work. So the government's minded to do this. That's, that's the opinion of the FT. Maybe, you know, read into that how you want to. But um, that will, that's quite seismic, right? And that kind of thing, I think, is going to be more impactful than what we're seeing short term on the wholesale market because that is fundamental to the economics of the, the, the projects that we just went through. So maybe in that scenario, your private wire solar is the IRR is less, yeah, because I'm I'm avoiding less in my power stack. So there's lots to consider. It's very volatile um, time in power markets at the moment. It's lots of regulatory change coming in. Jeremy mentioned there the heat and buildings. Um, strategy that's been delayed three times, I think, twice at least. I'm thinking three times. You know, basically, there's no answer. That's, you know, my, again, my opinion, but there's no, they don't have an answer, so they just keep delaying it. So there's lots of change. There's lots of need, yeah. needs to be done, and it's all going to affect the economics of both existing and planned projects. Yeah. No, that was a huge question and thank you very much for your answer. That was really interesting. Thanks, James. I'm conscious we're slightly over time, so I think we need to wrap this up. Um, it just remains for me to say thank you to all the participants. And um, I think you'll be sent a recording of this session for those of you who weren't able to join or dropped off early. Um, and thank you most of all to our speakers. Um, really interesting and thought provoking talks. Um, and if, if you do have any questions for anyone that's spoken today, I'm sure um, you can email them and they'd be happy to try and pick up on those points. So thank you and have a good day. That concludes today's webinar. You may now all disconnect. Thank you.